Hey everyone, just want to do a quick video, do an update. I uh, haven't had a chance to put many videos out lately, so I figured I had uh, something exciting come in that I ordered, and I uh, figured I'd show it off a little bit. This is a campaign map based on the uh, Warfare in the Age of Reason Sport of Kings campaign map. I basically uh, uh, basically redrew it in campaign cartographer and then uh, had them printed out on a vinyl. Uh, it's four foot by six foot vinyl and I have made some changes as you can probably see if you're familiar with it. So there's the naval movement uh, that's familiar with the original, but I've also included stuff for the third edition changes. Uh, we got a VP production track uh, so that you can keep track of stuff on the board. Got these little anchors. Uh, these are ports, and basically uh, nothing special with them, but basically just to denote um, for those territories that have. Um, those territories that have or touch multiple sea zones, um, you use the port symbol for your navy um, uh, to determine which uh, which side of the uh, territory they went in, or whatever the case may be. Um, generic label, you know, turn track. I kind of you know wanted to it took up the space, so turn track out to 24 turns, even though you know most games probably won't last that long. But, you know, that's the nice thing of it is you can do different scenarios and vary it up a little bit. And depending on how you want to do the end of game conditions, you can change the status of uh, how long a game lasts and stuff like that. <clears throat> uh, but again, everything's based upon the third edition to include uh, all the Spanish supplement. Um, these kind of light tan areas, those would be your rough terrain areas mountain passes and in the third edition all mountain passes can be crossed so in some of the older maps they had gaps in areas that you can cross mountain passes before I just filled that in to denote that you know so there wasn't anything different about them all mountain passes can be can be crossed and then I figured <clears throat> since really it's only going to be England France and Spain messing around with uh, the colonies, I've, I've put them all on the England, France, and Spanish side of, of the European map, so that way the English, French, and Spanish player can all sit on the same side of the board and, uh, you know, don't have to do any crazy reaching or anything like that. So you got your uh, North America, Caribbean, stuff like that with your uh, different areas. And then... Uh, India. India is based off of the third edition map, so all the, the points are based off the third edition uh, territorial values, and then also a sea zone for Manila. So got that campaign map. Obviously, uh, again, I, I don't know if I said it before, but the, the the full map in total is four foot by six foot. So at the moment, I don't have a, a table big enough to spread that out on, but. Uh, all that really means is that uh, I have an excuse now to build myself a bigger gaming table. Um, I did do a couple changes from the basic map and uh, my group and I we were talking about some adjustments and uh, actually there's only really one that's significant that makes a difference as far as the campaign map goes. You know, Beyond the, the, the ports, which itself is, is nothing, it's just more of a visualization. But uh, one thing we talked about doing is we added um, basically this double arrow between Ireland and England, which allows um, movement between those two territories without the need of a transport fleet. Uh, it also means that they would be basically a supply line, etc. So for example, Sweden and Pomerania, those two territories are together, that's in the core and then also through the Dardanelles uh, between Rumelia and Turkey, there's the double arrow. So those are the same. My group and I, we just decided that something something didn't feel right with Ireland kind of st stuck out in the in the middle of the Atlantic. You know, if you didn't have some kind of connection, um, so we decided to put the double arrow to basically mean that they, you know, the English player can move between Ireland and England freely, no big deal. 
but the caveat that we talked about also adding is that Ireland can be invaded by a naval invasion. So, you know, England would get something being able to move freely to Ireland, but they'd also have to defend it, um, to defend against naval invasions. So there's, there's the campaign map. I'm pretty excited to get this to use. So what I, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get tokens to represent. So instead of, you know, my campaign videos being a picture, uh, I'm gonna do the campaign video and all the movements and stuff like that. It's gonna be moving pieces. So it might be easier in that regard for play, uh, viewers to follow along with uh, what's going on in the, um, the campaign. Because uh, I've had a couple of comments saying that they weren't exactly clear. I'd, I'd rattle off some territorial names and they weren't exactly clear where those were at. Whereas now, if I have tokens, I can say, hey, they're moving from Albania to Bosnia. And I could actually show moving the token, and that way you guys know where it's at. It's easier for you guys to follow along. And then finally, uh, <clears throat> kind of when I ordered this, I also ordered, uh, with the third edition coming out, they had some changes to the rules and additions. So I made my own kind of quick reference sheet, but the way it's set up is is it's played in order. So you start at the top, you have your rivals, command phase, your rally phase, etc., 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 control checks, etc. As you continue to play and you move through the turn, once you start to get into the charge phase, then each section. So here's stuff talking about charge. So the charge stuff has all of the quick reference items dealing with the charge only so instead of in the in the in the basic um, QRS it has all of the movement together charge and non-charge movement this just has in the charge second if you're charging you can just look at this charge page because this is the phase of the turn you're in and say hey this is how much I move when I'm doing a charge move and if you need to make any rolls or modifiers or stuff like that and then once you get to normal movement Again, normal movement and unit type and stuff like that. So that way you don't have, you know, it's less to have to look through. It's, you're only dealing with normal movement. Um, you're only dealing with charge movement over here. So you don't have to kind of fiddle your way through the whole chart. Terrain effects, uh, then it comes down to artillery fire. Again, these include all the changes for uh, the third edition stuff. So artillery rates, base dice are different. Um, then I also uh, try to do as best as I could, and I imagine if, if somebody goes through the rules of the fine tooth comb, they'll probably find some that I missed. But I tried to include all of the um, army, in individual army um, notes. Like, for example, artillery first fire, if you're Russian, it's a 2d6 instead of a 1d6. Um, uh, for example, also the. Um, Oh, that's in small arms fire. There's a couple of small arms fire. For example, yeah, Hessian and Hanoverian uh, battalion guns on a point blank charge during charge phase. It's a plus 2d6 instead of a normal 1d6. So I tried to include all those different kinds of notes that were army specific um, in these lists. So that way, you know, most of the cases you could just look straight at this and not have to remember. Um, and look through the look flip through the book to find something that you might have missed. So again, there's I, I've probably missed one or two in there, but I, I think I re reading through the rules, I think I got most of them. So yeah, you have your all of your phases. You have your arrival phase, your uh, your rally phase, charge, plotting, charging, movement, normal movement, artillery fire, artillery morale, small arms fire, morale, melee, and then army withdraw down here. And then on the back page um, is the, the procedure for the morale test, which can happen at different points uh, during, the, during uh, a turn. So instead of having a morale test for each individual one, I just decided to put it all on the back. And then also leader casualties, um, again, they can be affected uh, at any point. So, so those are listed like that as well. And then with that, I also made kind of a casualty tracker chart. And it's all just basically what you would use for um, keep track of how many casualties you have. Depending on how many casualties or how many you know units you have in the army fighting the battle, 
depending on how many casualties you take will determine how many, you know, when you need to start rolling for withdrawal. So, kind of takes into account. There's also pluses and minus for if you capture colors or lose colors, capture batteries, etc. Uh, and then the actual <coughs> mark, I, I decided to use squares, and since uh, SPs, and that's kind of how the campaign uh, unit designation stuff that's moved on the map, it's um, an SP is considered to be 12 castings, so I put these in 12 casting blocks so it's easier as casualties mount. It's easier to convert them to um, casualties on the campaign map. So you, know, you get 12, st uh, 12 block unit blocks, uh, artilleries, artilleries in four. Some countries have guard units and they have a guard infantry and a guard cavalry, so <clears throat> that takes into account um, if there's a guard unit present. Militia units, there's ter territorial militia um, that, uh, depending on if you're uh, defending a territory or not, that you know you might get some extra units on top of what you normally have to defend the territory, so that takes that into account there. And then allies, that's supposed to represent uh, native allies if you're in the colonies. Um, those countries get a role for native allies. Uh, you know, there's also additional, you know, there's marines. In some situations, you might get a marine unit. And so you can track that by, you know, marking it separate. Or, you know, if you don't have any militia there, you can use the militia box as the marine box or the guard box or whatever, whatever the case may be. But, anyways, I, I figure that'd be kind of a cool representation. It's laminated. I'm kind of hoping, I haven't tested it, but I'm kind of hoping that the, uh, I can use like a wet erase marker or maybe a grease pencil, you know, just mark along as we go and then, you know, when the battle's done, you know, erase it or wipe it off or whatever, so. That's what I've got now. Hopefully uh, I'll start implementing this um, sooner than later. I'm going to start buying, uh, I need to acquire some tokens and, uh, I think probably what I'll do first is maybe put up a couple of videos playing the campaign map as if it were a board game. And so that way we can kind of get a feel of using the, this big strategic map and stuff like that. So that's all the news I have for now. Um, figured some of you guys, getting into especially the Age of Reason players, would get a kick out of the, the big giant campaign map. So. Uh, yeah, it's vinyl. I got it printed off at FedEx Kinko's. I got, you know, one of the, like, outdoor banner or vinyl or whatever. It's got grommets, so, you know, we can hang it up on the wall. Um, if I got wall space, which I don't right now, so, yep. Anyways, um, I'll talk to you all later. Happy gaming.